Many years ago, I was sitting in a theater uh, with some friends, it's something we all do at various times, and we were watching an adventure movie when the projector jammed and the film broke. Now, this was the pre-digital days, so when film broke, it actually melted. I don't know if anyone has ever been there when that happens, but uh, you know, a film strip or a movie strip back then, this was at the actually the dollar cinema in our in our town, and uh, it actually physically melted. You could see it go uh, on the screen, and it was just a fascinating thing. And to make uh, matters worse, the breakdown wasn't at the beginning of the movie, right? It wasn't during the credits or the rolling things at the beginning or even at the end. It was toward the end. It was like only a few minutes left in the movie and, and I hadn't seen the movie before and so we were all emotionally invested in this movie and it was grinding along, you know, and then right near the end, at its most exciting point, all of a sudden, and it, the sound went, the, the melting happened and, and you could actually see then the white screen and they flicked the lights on. And just before that film broke, again, we as an audience were in another place. We were in another world, right? For a few glorious moments, that movie had done what movies do when they're good, which is take you out of the here and now and transport you to the there and then. I mean, if you are watching a sci-fi movie, you know, it doesn't feel like fiction. It, you're right in it. You're right there. And we were surrounded by the audio soundtrack and caught up in the story and dazzled by the special effects and all of this. But it came to a sudden and inglorious end there, a sudden screeching halt. And without warning, again, the music just stopped. The screen went bright white and we were all like, <laughs> what, what has happened? And there was like a collective gasp out of all the people in the audience. Um, and, and gas turned to groans and boos and a few of the unruly youth um, who I knew uh, threw popcorn, you know, at the screen and started, you know, just uh, basically causing a ruckus. And within a few seconds, again, the house lights came up, reality returned, and the person from the movie theater actually said, hey, this was our one copy. It's been damaged. Uh, there's no way to finish out the film, and we're really sorry. You know, and we were all like, what? what? Well, they did give us our dollar back. I mean, I think about that. They gave us our dollar back. But that was a really small consolation for me because at one moment, we were like, you know, figuratively speaking, in a galaxy far, far, far away. And the next moment, man, we were in a rundown theater with the lights on. The seats were worn out. The peeling paint was obvious. And, you know, the sticky floors as we walked out with our dollar in hand, we were like, I got gypped. You know, I, I don't, uh, this is, doesn't make me happy. And so I think about it again. We went in that moment from the glorious then and there to the not so glorious here and now. And it wasn't an easy transition. And the truth is we didn't like it. We didn't feel like we got our money's worth. And in a way, that's kind of what happens to me mentally when I read from 1 Corinthians 15, straight through to 1 Corinthians 16. Like I'm reading along and I'm like, 1 Corinthians, what an ending. What an amazing thing. Roll the credits, the end. This is awesome. End on eternity. You know, end strong, Paul. Yeah, give them that. The resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. Just, just chop it right there. You know, that'd be a great ending. One of the most glorious chapters of the Bible. It transports us to eternity, you know, there and then. It we're filled with the hope of heaven, if you read that, the eternal bliss in the presence of God. Death has been defeated, a glorified body. There's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no suffering, majesty, glory, hallelujah. And then and the lights go on and it's, it's 1 Corinthians 16 and you're like, what? What happened? Now you might say, I don't, well, I don't, then I should walk out now, right? Give me my dollar back and I want to go. But the thing is, there's something in this that will teach us so much if we'll stay tuned to it. First verse there of chapter 16, think about what he's saying. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the church of Galatia, so you must do also. Now, again, you think about this, must is never a word I like. Um, just must means you have to do it, but also must is like musty, right? I mean, it's just in none of its words do I warm up to the word must. You must do this. And he talks about the collection for the saints. 
And so when you think about this, I can picture a collective groan <laughs> coming from the Corinthian church as they read through this. They're like, yes, 1 Corinthians 15. Wait, wait a minute. What, what? The collection? And they were just talking about heaven where the streets are paved with gold, right? And now Paul brings them way back to earth and talks about a need that's going on. And I can picture again them complaining, we don't want to focus on the here and now. We like the there and then. Right? I, I don't want to talk about those things. And when I think about a here and now chapter, it can be challenging and it can be painfully practical and it's a tough transition. It is for me, it might be for you, but I think about to go from heaven back to earth, that's not a, a path I want to go on. I can definitely think of looking forward to heaven, but I can't think of being in heaven and looking forward to earth. I really can't. And so when you think about that, it's it's this broken projector moment, the unfinished film, the thing here is it's not a malfunction or a mistake. It's something that I think a message that God is trying to send. And so when you think about it, 1 Corinthians, the ending actually is God's perfect ending to this book. And, and when I think about that, the practical follow-up on a chapter of eternity, it probably brings us to the first major point that I want to make there, which is that God makes, wants us to live here and now in the light of there and then, right? I mean, we should see eternity very clearly as we're going through this murky, musty world that we're here, the dusty earth. So when I think about that, if we forget about 1 Corinthians 13, or 15, or 13 for that matter, but 1 Corinthians 15, the, all the chapters that went before, and this was the only chapter, then it, it wouldn't really do the same thing. But I want you to go back, if you would, one verse or one set of verses into chapter 15 just to kind of get a running start. And it's probably, to me, again, the highlight of the highlight reel from chapter 15. It says, therefore, my beloved, this is verse 58. So 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is is not in vain in the Lord. So what he's saying with therefore, because anytime you see therefore, it goes to what's before. Therefore, he's saying as a result of the resurrection, as the result of eternity, there is worthwhile work here on earth, but it's going to be work. It's going to be labor. I mean, labor and work are not words that really people associate with, with heaven too much. I mean, not, not really in that sense, you know. Um, the, the need for immovability and laboring is something and abounding in work and all this stuff. And he says, this is what's the important thing is if you connect the here and now to the there and then, here and now feels so very different and looks very different than it would if there was no there and then. And that's why I think this is the probably most important question for any person to answer, which is, what am I supposed to do with this life in light of the fact that it's fleeting, in light of the fact that it's over soon, but it is connected to an eternity that never ends? And, and how that perspective changes everything. And it's a common complaint, I think, that people make, whether they say it in these ways or not, which is that someone is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that one where it's kind of like, oh, this person's always talking about there and then, you know, and the sweet by and by, and they've got their head in the clouds, but they don't make any difference here. But the thing is, 1 Corinthians makes it impossible for that to be a truly Christian perspective. The, the Christian perspective would be if I have my head in the clouds, I would have my feet very firmly planted here on earth. I, it would make a much different perspective on my entire life. If the more we focus on heaven, the more fruitful we'll be on earth. The more worth we will be here, uh, the more work we might do here, the more labor and love we might in, you know, influence the world with. And so I think about it again, an investment in the there and then will make a difference in the here and now bringing passion and all the rest of what we do. So uh, again, some thoughts that I've, I've put down. I hope this one's helpful. Um, I've used it before, but I'll use it again. It's what we're believing is how we'll be living. You know, there's a connection to the belief and behavior are, are very well connected. You can't say you believe something if you don't act on it. Um, otherwise, you really don't 
believe it. And so there's three areas that he will talk about, and they conveniently fall into the categories of different P words, so I'm going to use those. But the first one is possessions. He talks about possessions. And I think um, if there's only here and now, you should be possessed by your possessions, right? You should be obsessed with your possessions because <laughs> here and now is what there is. And this is what Paul's again saying is that there's more to life than what you see. So uh, it's a, you're going to have possessions, but you shouldn't be possessed by your possessions. So this is what he talks about with our possessions. He says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now I think about this. I, this might be one of my personal favorite verses on uh, the subject of giving because there's so much packed into this one little thing. I, I love it. He talks about an offering. He talks about a collection. And when he does, he's talking about what they should do for the Gentile church. The Gentile church there was actually giving to the, G the Jewish church, okay? When you think about it, there were Jews in uh, Jerusalem and in other areas that were horribly persecuted for their faith, right? But in Corinth, the truth was you might have been mildly made fun of for being a Christian, but pretty much anything went in Corinth. If you were into Christ, they might have thought you were a goofball, but you'd probably not lose your job or your friends or your family connections as a result of that. I mean, you really wouldn't. Corinth was not a place that persecuted Christians, at least not in the time that this was written. It was a prosperous place. And so, ironically, Jerusalem, the place that Jesus had ministered directly, the place that the church, the Christian church, had really grown out of, um, that place was horribly persecuted for their faith. And um, they were, uh, for you to, as a Christian, uh, declare that as a Jew in Jerusalem, you pretty much could write off your business. Your business was going to fail. Your family was going to be ostracized. So again, when you think about this thing, Paul was actually turning the attention of the people in Corinth who were like, yeah, this Christianity thing's pretty cool. And they said, yeah, well, you're continuing to prosper in it, but guess what? There's a group of people who don't. And so he was turning their attention to that. And I think about that in my own life. It's a very interesting thought. It, it tends to be that, um, you know, a lot of times people in prosperous areas say, you know, keep giving to this prosperous ministry so that you might continue to prosper and everything else. But that is not the cycle that Paul even did he actually looked over and said is there somewhere where you have more than somebody else and in that somebody else who is following christ just as faithfully or more so than you would there be any uh way that you would instead of being possessed by your possessions think well hey in in eternity i will invest in eternity see that's what he's looking at and i think it's very very important to get that um when when he talks about it there's several things that will enlighten any one of us in the book of acts it actually uh, there was a famine going on physically also in jerusalem at the time this was written so connecting all these dots it's pretty interesting they had spiritual uh you know opposition to what they were doing but also they were just plain having a hard time they were they were having a difficult time and so you could be a christian in corinth and be living high on the hog there there was nothing that would prevent that but you know what not the same for people in some other areas. So Paul reminds them in chapter 15, this world is not all there is. There's going to be inequalities in this world. And, uh, you know, one of the things that somebody can do is if they think about the world to come, they'll realize, you know what, someone who was doing really well here on earth might not be doing so well in eternity and vice versa. And so when we really believe that, I think it does affect, it should affect, it must, as he said, influence how we think about these things and so what he's telling them is you have an opportunity now to invest now and here here and now to invest in the there and then right and he knew that gentile generosity would really open doors for the gospel why because it's funny how um, a lot of times people think that that people are closed off to our ideologies and i don't think they are so much as uh, what can be 
true that people want more than an idea. They want to see does, how does that idea actually affect you? How does it actually affect your decisions and what you do? And so if the Jews who had historically, think about it, hated the Gentiles and the Gentiles had hated the Jews in return, if they were actually putting money where their mouth was and money where their message was and saying, look, I don't just tell you the gospel is free and heaven is free. I'm willing to finance that thought on some level. I want you actually to be affected by that. And, you know, just this last week, it was so instructive for me because um, I, I got to spend time with uh, the family that Stephen, our, our son, is dating their daughters. They're a a pastoral family as well, so a couple of PKs, what could go wrong? Um, but but you, think of, you think of that, and um, her, the, the girl's mom um, was actually a sponsored child uh, through one of the gospel outreaches. You know, it was uh, like Compassion International, but not, but, it, but another one like that. And they reached out to her family, and guess what? The organization moved on, but their family didn't. And this family actually sponsored her all the way through a, a master's degree. I mean, this family was so committed to her spiritual and emotional and physical well-being that they basically adopted a child from China and you know, carried her life through. Now, when I think about that, I go, that's... That person has a lot of input and influence into a person's life. More than just, hey, praying for you, care about you, things like that. You know? And so when I think about it, it's, it's, it is true that money talks, right? And so talking about money can be uncomfortable sometimes, but I think Paul was very comfortable doing it because he's like, you know what? It's just money at the end of the day. It, it'll come, it'll go. And so I think about this, one of the ways that doors have opened for us in different ways in our life is that we have always tried to put this principle into practice. You know, in Miami, we used to live about a mile from NASCAR, uh, the NASCAR track. And the NASCAR track, uh, actually, people would move their RVs into it for the week and all this kind of stuff. It was a whole city got set up because they would do the NASCAR championship. Now, some people care nothing about NASCAR, but... Uh, you know, I'm not really a NASCAR fan per se, but I really like this event because we would go to that camp out and we would actually run a church service for them down there. We just run a, a church service in it. And one of the things that we did as part of this outreach is we would just bring coolers full of water, um, coffee, uh, pastries of various kind, you know, everything. And it was all free. Okay, well, I can guarantee you at the NASCAR championship, nothing was free. I mean, like a bo bottle of uh, water this big was 10 bucks, you know, and, and people would come up to us and say, hey, how much is the water? And you go, well, it's free. How much is, how much is that donut? Well, it's free too. It goes with the free water. And we were like, this is weird. This is plain weird. And we ended up having tremendous conversations with people over the years simply because of the free that it was, but it wasn't free to us. I mean, someone had to invest in that, right? But it was an internal uh, and eternal investment that people said, you know, I'll invest in that because I think people matter and the conversations that are going on here matter and that church service matters. And I can ne never forget certain parts of it. You know, it, it was really amazing. There was a time when I was out at the booth really early and the whole thing is we had to set up very early for all this stuff because the, uh, you know, the way, the way things were, it was traffic and everything else. So I, I go over there and I was setting up and it was already hot and dusty in the morning. I mean, it was just sun just coming up and it was already hot and, you know, just dust everywhere and even had to clean up other people's trash to even get things ready to where it looked. And I had a woman who was walking around come up to me and say, thank you for being here and doing this. Because she said, we come here year over year, and there's no way for us to get to a church service from here. But we go to church every, every time we, we get a chance in different towns and stuff. But, you know, you guys actually bring the church to us. And she said, you know what? Different people from my family gave their life to the Lord at this service last year. People who, didn't, who thought Christianity was all messed up and that they would look down on people like us or that they wouldn't have a place for us. Um, it, this, it just totally changed my kid's life. And then they went home and they were so changed that their grandmother 
actually came to the Lord as a result of their change that she'll never be out here but this outreach reached all the way to that and I think about that again and some people would say well why do you waste your time doing those things and you go well why would I waste my time doing other things because that's an investment in the here and now in the there and then and I think about that again those opportunities come and they go but they're only there when they're there I mean that was an opportunity we had when it was there and I don't have that opportunity anymore you know, I got to do the opening prayer for the NASCAR races. I live right here in NASCAR country. Nobody asks, nobody cares. But there, because of the investment we made in the practical, everyday thing, that door opened up. And I think about that again. It was, it was our willingness to serve people without reward that brought tremendous reward. And so this is what Paul is saying with this thing. And he gives some principles, I think, that would help anyone thinking about this first of all he said lay something aside I don't know if you saw that in your translation but it, it says lay something aside it doesn't say lay everything aside <laughs> right I mean first of all it there's a recognition that in the here and now you have needs other people have needs and it is not your job or mine as a Christian to bankroll everybody's desires in life but he says set aside something Notice it's not, it doesn't tell you exactly what it should be. Um, and he says, set it aside first. So I wrote down the word priority because I don't know about you, but there's always more month at the end of my money, right? There's always some month left over at the end of my money. So uh, business owners, small business owners are always told by entrepreneurs, pay yourself first. Why? Because they know if you pay yourself last, you won't last. You won't make it. You, you have to prioritize certain things in a budget or else it's, it's, it's going to budge, right? There's no budge in the budget. So when you think about that, that's what he says. He says that the first part of the week, just go ahead and lay something aside. Lay something aside. Don't have it be the leftover lint in your pocket and go, huh, a paper clip and a broken rubber band. I wonder what God could do with that. Well, maybe lots of things. But again, he says priority. The, the personal nature of this I love because he says personal. Each one, it doesn't say a few of you should do this. Everyone else, I know you're struggling or whatever. He says each one of you there in Corinth need, should do this. You should, you should prioritize this and it should be personal. He doesn't say the, rich, the, the 20 richest people among you should do this and everyone else doesn't need to do it. Giving is someone else's role. He says, nope, you should do it. I love this because he talks about proportionate, right? Some people have certain percentages that they really believe the New Testament teaches. I happen to not believe that. But um, in context, you see him talking about proportionate. He says, storing as you may prosper. What does that mean? If you make more, you should give more. Uh, it's not a flat tax, you know, because when you think about that, uh, somebody who's living at subsistence level and somebody who's got so many luxuries they don't know what to do with them all, there's a capacity that changes in different people's lives. And everyone thinks uh, that someone else is richer than they are. But he, he basically says, you know what? There's no specific figure given here. But he says, if God keeps pouring into your life, how could you not think, well, this is just the here and now. How much of this stuff can I use anyway before I go to the there and then? So he's, he makes it proportion. He makes it priority so that it doesn't get left over and left out. He makes it personal. Hey, each one of you should do it. Um, he makes it proportionate. And the, the really cool part, this is my favorite part, is he makes it pressure free. Notice what he says in verse two. He says that there would be no collection while I'm here. You know, I think about this. He wasn't, wouldn't have been embarrassed, I don't think, but he just didn't want to give priority to that. It, it wasn't like Paul's coming to town and he's going to shake down everybody while he's there. He's going to fleece that flock. He just kind of says, look, before I get there, Figure this out, and when I get there, we'll deliver whatever we got. And I love the fact, again, that he does not put the hard sell on him. He doesn't put pressure on him. It's not like Paul walking around the room with a bucket saying, hey, Apostle Paul here, we're doing the Apostle Paul collection while I'm here. He says, in fact, I don't want that done. I don't want him giving to Paul I don't want them giving because of Paul. I want them giving because, how could you not, in light of the now 
and the then, the here and the there. He says, when, when you think about the importance of, of eternity and you think how quickly this all goes. See, I think about it this way. This either makes perfect sense to someone or it makes them perfectly tense. And, and I think about it again, it, appeals for money can do either one for me. They either make sense or they make me tense. When somebody's manipulative, I get tense. I, and, and not like, I just like, there's no way they're getting my money. Nobody can hard sell me. Um, but nobody needs to hard sell me on the fact that eternity is a good investment. Eternity is a great investment. Hey, I've invested in that. Our families invest in that. We will continue to invest in that. We will prioritize that. It will be personal. It will be proportionate. If God gives us more, we do more. God gives us less, we're able to do less. But I think through all of that, um, God has done more than I could have imagined. And again, I don't respond well to pressure. And, I, and because of it, I don't really pressure people. But I think about different priorities in my life at different times. There was a time when I used to be, as my wife well knows, a car addict. Um, I was really into, really, really into vintage Volkswagens, you know, and I had six of them at one time. Um, and there was a particular one that I had that was a 1954 European beetle that had a, a, a cloth rag top. It was very, very rare. And it had certain one year only items on it. And one of the things it had was a, a tail light on it that was a heart shaped tail light. They only made it for one year. Well, you can imagine the popularity this has among collectors and to have that car right for shows, I had to have the heart tail lights. And I can remember this was, ooh man, uh, 30 years ago. So this was a long time ago. They've only gone up and gotten more rare then. But there was a time when this will show you my addiction. I was there at a place and I, they had them and they were $500 for the pair, for a pair of tail lights. And I said, I'll take them. I'll take them, why? Because I have to have them because it has to be right. And I, you know, it's part of the reason I was able to and needed to sell that car and get it out of my life because it, it put me too much in the here and now. <laughs> and, but when I think about it, Nobody had to argue with me on that or pressure me on it. Like the guy didn't have to hard sell me on it. He's like, they're 500 bucks. And if I didn't want them, the guy after me would have because it was a good investment. It actually was. Uh, part of the reason I sold that car for so much when I did sell it is it had the correct items in it. It had a person who had bought the right taillights for it. And so when I think about that again, you don't have to hard sell something that's a good investment. And that's what Paul is putting here. I think it's really, really wonderful because, uh, you know, you don't ever want to have regrets over something you've done where, you know, someone talked you into it and then you go home and talk yourself out of it. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. If, if someone can't go, hey, this is an amazing investment. I'm excited to do it. Um, then they shouldn't do it. And Paul here goes on in verse three, he says, whenever I come, whoever you approve by your letters, I'll send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it's fitting, I go also, they'll go with me. See, I love this because think about what he's saying right here. He's talking about accountability. He's saying, pick someone you trust to do this. Pick someone you know to do it. He says, I, I, I'm not saying that like it's, it's going to be like, you know, give it to Paul and Paul disappears. He says, you pick him. You pick him. And if, it, and if you want me to go with him, I will. Um, if it's fitting, if it's right, if it makes sense, if they need someone to go with them, I know the trail pretty well. Um, so, you know, he, but he basically says the Corinthian people should pick the people they trust to do this. And I love that. I love the, the fact that, you know, there's a here and now reality about the things of there and then. Again, there and then, heaven Nobody gyps people in heaven, but the truth is people gyp people here. And Paul knew that, and he knew that there had to be a built-in accountability to what he did. There had to be a trust factor in what he did. And, you know, uh, I laugh about this because this is the reality that hits me every day. You know, I, I work at a, at a Christian school, and so many of the in, environments I've been in are, are related to, to Christian environments. And sometimes... Uh, Christians think that they just that people should just trust them so they just should trust them because they put a fish on their card or something and you're like well, I don't know about that I've, 
I've, some things have been pretty fishy that had a fish on them, right? I mean, and, and when I think about that again, I, I, I don't just go for a plumber because he's a Christian plumber. I get advice from people and say, is he good? I don't, I don't care. I mean, I'd love to talk about the Bible with him, but I need my pipes to work, right? So when I think about that, the, Paul is saying there's, there's a reality to this stuff. You know, we can't just claim heaven and, and expect people to, to believe in that, you know? And we used to have a joking thing. I mean, it was half joking lament in the church office and I brought it here too, which is, can't we just teach the Bible? Because there's so many times when we have to fill out some ridiculous form that's like 75 pages long on, you know, the form 990 this and the this and that tax form and stuff. And, you know, pastors especially can are really bad sometimes about saying, well, I don't need to do that. You know, that's the earthly, I don't work for them. I work for God. And you're like, if you work for God, you work for them. I mean, get over it. Fill out the form. Um, you know, can't we just teach the Bible? Yes, you can. And this is what the Bible teaches, is that if there's a report to do, you need to do it. If there's a procedure to follow, you need to do it. If there's structure and controls and integrity, that's part of it. Um, you know, don't, don't think that you can have your head in the clouds without having your hands clean here on earth. And I think about that, again, there's, there's so often that people think that these two worlds don't intersect, but they intersect tremendously. And how we live our here and now life is reflective of what we believe about the there and then. See, so again, I, I look at how we treat our possessions. That's an important one. What I'm believing is how I'll be living. And if I think that the gospel is a matter of life and death, then I think it's a pretty good investment of temporary things to turn temporary things, time, treasures, and talents into eternal payoffs. I think that's a good investment. Now, the thing he talks about after he talks about handling money, he talks about time. So this is the second P word I would leave with you, which is plans. Um, Paul handled his possessions certain ways, you know, but he also handled his time certain ways. And I think this is important too. Uh, when I think about eternity, it, it'll be forever, right? But I don't have forever now. I don't have forever to have friends. I don't have forever to have uh, an influence on people while I'm here on this planet. I don't have uh, endless minutes. Um, you know, when I think about that, it means I have to manage my time as well as my money and maybe even my time more effectively than my money. And so verse five, he says, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia for I am passing through Macedonia. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's funny that he puts it in parentheses or, he, you know, he, he reiterates it. Verse five. Now I, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. What, he didn't stay in Macedonia and stay there forever. Right. He says, I'm going through there. And I'm on my way to another thing and I'm going to come see you. I'm going to do it. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. What's he saying? He's basically saying, if y'all are generous people, um, I'm, I'll stay. And if you'll, you got a place for me, I'll stay. And if not, I'll just keep on going because, uh, you know, I need to keep on going. And he says, and I don't wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Now, again, he was scheduling, planning a, an itinerary and sharing it with them and saying, there's certain places I'm going to zip through, <laughs> keep driving. There's certain places that I'm going to stay for a while if I can. And if the Lord permits it, he's the person I'm getting the permit from. And so, again, I think of Paul as a man with a plan, a man on a mission. And he knew that the time was ticking. He knew that the clock was going. And he knew that eternity was forever, but this was not. He didn't have forever to go to Macedonia and spend forever there. And then I'm going to go to Corinth and spend forever there and all the rest of that. So time was not something to waste for him, but something to invest. And I think chapter 15 tells us something very, very important, which is we have eternity to enjoy. But chapter 16 reminds us we don't have all the time in the world here while we're in the world. And again, if I get so eternal in my mindset, I'm kind of like, no hurry. 
But there is a hurry in my heart. Why? Because time's a ticking. Time's a ticking. You know, people who can just waste weekends, waste time. And I'm not saying workaholism. I'm not saying that, man, I, I did not waste my time yesterday. I rode my bike in a national park. It was an investment in all kinds of things. It was an investment in continued physical health, mental health, capacity to, to keep pouring into people during the week and different things. I'm all for that. But what, and you'll see that even next book, you know, Paul talks about self-maintenance quite a bit. But the Corinthians here in Corinth, he wanted to remind them, tick, 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 you know, we need, I'm, I'm on a mission <laughs> and I, I have a direction and I have a plan and going with the flow and being flexible is wonderful. But again, uh, Paul had a mixture of both. Notice he kind of says, well, I might do this or I might not. We'll see what God does. We'll see what happens when I get there. But he had criteria for how he would know. One of the ways he knows is, is like, if it's, if it's bearing fruit, I will continue to invest in it. If it isn't, man, there are fruitful places I need to invest. And when I think about that, I think of it on an even personal person uh, uh, thing. I... Uh, you know, don't have a minimum quota. Uh, Jesus didn't. Jesus invested in one person all the time. So it, it's not numbers, it's quality. It's quality of investment and quality of things coming on, not quantity. But you think about this, God calls us to prayerfully plan our life and, and to actually carefully manage our time. And it's okay to tell somebody they're a passing through person. Again, I don't always say it that way necessarily, but Paul said to Macedonia, of Macedonia, I'm passing through there. I'm not staying. Because why? I don't know. He didn't really go into an elaborate reason, but I think he knew that Corinth was a high risk, high return place. And Macedonia might have been, well, you know, it's just not God's place for me. And so when you read through 2 Corinthians, and we will, you'll see Paul's plans did not work at all like he originally planned. <laughs> God went to plan B, C, D, probably Z, double Z somewhere. It, but this is what is cool. He did everything he said he would do. It, he just did it in a different order. He did it in a different way. Everything that he, along the way in his letters, peppered with, well, I'm hoping to come to you by this winter. Well, guess what? In most cases, it was three winters later and he was a prisoner. But he did make it just like he had planned. And so when I think about that, again, God expects us to make, expects us to make plans and then we should plan for the unexpected. Does that make sense? Living here and now is an eternal balancing act because I don't really have to... Uh, you know, manage my time when time is not a thing. But right now, boy, time, I, again, I tell people you can't save time and money usually at the same time. It takes time to save money. It takes money to save time. And uh, I, more and more, uh, people who've known me a long time know I don't spend money easily. But if it buys me time, it's a good trade. Why? Because money... I've found it in my pants pocket before, but I have never found an hour in my pants pocket, right? As I'm going through the wash. Oh, what do you know? <laughs> a whole hour that I didn't know was there. So you know what? Time, time, time. Very, very valuable. And I love his qualifiers. He says things like, if the Lord permits, as the Lord allows. And when I think about this, I, 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 I think of the pendulum. I hope this picture will help you. Um, again, trying to be respectful of our time here. I'm talking fast. The chapter's got lots in it. But um, pendulum swings on an on a old-timey clock. You know, that pendulum goes back and forth. Uh, I think we have a natural tendency that if we're honest, we know what it is. And God wants us to have a supernatural tendency. And what I mean by that is if you're a person who has to be around people all the time, God may pendulum swing you to need some alone time with him. And he may actually have to work hard to carve that out. And if you're a person like I am who has a tendency to alone time with myself and with God, those work out great. Um, it's, he'll pendulum swing me back toward investing in people and getting around people and, and connecting with all that. Um, if you're a person who tends to procrastinate, 
God may accelerate your plans. If you're a person who tends to plan all ahead, God may frustrate your plans and say, well, you know what, that, that's your plan, let's see mine. Um, if you're a person, again, who uh, tends to plan everything out, don't be surprised if God uh, you know, mixes things up for you. But if you're a person who, again, just kind of goes, oh, I just let God lead, well, he might lead you to have additional structure that you're not used to. And so I think about that again, the pendulum swing. Um, Psalm 90, 12 says this, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, teach us to know the clock is ticking, that we might wi make wiser decisions now. Um, but look what he says in verse 8. I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. He just told him how long he's going to stay where he is. Um, and and it's, there's a milestone. There's a purpose to what he's doing purpose of pentecost he's like this is very very important why verse 9 a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries again as i think of um, plans think about this he wrote the corinthian letter from ephesus right and it was an area of idolatry they tried to kill him there in Ephesus because his ministry was so successful. Think about this. His ministry was so successful that people stopped buying idols in the marketplace and started investing in things that actually did matter. Okay, No more gold statues of Diana, the, you know, the Aphrodite goddess, you know, no... I, I don't want any, I, I don't need that. In fact, they burned in Ephesus a bunch of valuable witchcraft books that they just said, you know what? I can sell these on eBay, but I'm not going to. Nobody should be reading this junk. I'm getting rid of it. So they actually, that was the stuff going on in Ephesus, but not everyone liked that, right? Because some people who are possessed by their possessions didn't like that priority at all. And so there, there's people, you know, uh, quite a war going on in Ephesus, a culture war. And Paul tells the Corinthians why he's planning to stay where he is for now, which he says, there's an open door here and now. And I can't undervalue that. I can't, I can't ignore that. I think it's funny where he says great and effective door. That's the, the translation into English in the one I'm reading, which is the New King James, a great and effective door. But it's actually literally in the Greek, the, a one word thing. It's megador. A megador is open to me, which I just, I love it. He's like, it's like so huge. I can't even, I can't walk out that door. I got to keep walking through that door. He says, when, a, when God blows a door wide open, a rare wide open opportunity, I had to recognize those in my life. You've probably seen them in your own life. I know what it is to have mega doors open. I don't, I don't know if I have any real sense that there's mega doors open right now, but I know in my life I've had mega doors open. And you know, I learned from a friend who said, if, if a door's open, drive a semi through it. I mean, if a big door's open, just, just do that until you can't do that, you know? And, and you think about that, that's what Paul's saying. He's like, there's no way I'm leaving Ephesus, even though there's a lot of things open to me. How could I possibly leave this in spite of the fact that he says there are many adversaries? And this is what I wrote down for me, which is that big opportunities tend to have big opposition and little opportunities tend to have little opposition, right? In the here and now, I have limited time. Um, it, you know, and, and when I think about that, uh, if there really is a there and then, if there really is, as Paul suggested and as Jesus taught, an eternity that's life and death and you're either with God or without God forever, that's a pretty big stakes game right that's 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 an important thought and what he's saying is and if i have an opportunity and a window's open on that i should not be surprised that there's a spiritual force against that too you know sometimes people give up on things i know i have at various times in my life because there was opposition to it oh man there's so much opposition to this i don't know why we bother man if there's no opposition to it i don't know why we bother i mean you know what I'm saying? There's, a, there's some point where he's like, there's a mega door. <laughs> and there's a like Megatron also coming against me, right? I mean, there's, there's difficulty. 
Is there something in your life right now that you're doing here and now and part of the reason you don't do it as much as you could is it's just plain hard? And I think about that. We say, Lord, hold the door open. But again, the same door that opens God's opportunities opens the devil's opposition. And when I think about it, Anytime the Lord is moving, the devil's moving. And one of the ways I know in my life that something spiritually significant is the significant opposition that comes into it. Um, again, I don't know where you work. I don't know how you work. I don't know what, you, what different environments you do things in. But I have noticed a pattern that's just too, too real for it to be, uh, you know, a fabrication of my imagination, which is, Church-related work is harder. And what I mean by that is, like, we ordered an ice machine for our school. It's just an ice machine. I mean, it makes ice. And I have had to work harder to get this dumb ice machine to work than if, if I worked at, at, at a gas station and we bought an ice machine, you plug it in, you connect the water, you set the drain, you hit play and ice comes out and you sell it for 99 cents. The thing is, we don't sell ice. All we're trying to do is have ice available for the kids' special events. I got the tech guy on the phone and he's like, you have the nicest model. We bought the cheapest one of the nicest manufacturer. These people have the greatest repair record in the world. They're like, everyone's like, this thing's so easy. It works so great. People have said, oh, well, you must be doing something wrong. They look at it and they're like, I don't know what's wrong. This happens every single time we do anything that's gospel connected. Things that are so simple in everyday life are so hard. We used to apologize to people who would get a bid on jobs at our church. You know, an electrician would say, oh, yeah, I can light, just do these lights for uh, 400 bucks. And we'd shake their hand and say, you sure you want to do it? Yep, I want to do it. It's, it's a simple, I'll come in the afternoon and do it. We'd shake their hand and say, I'm sorry. Uh, and they'd go, what? You go, you'll see. And that guy would get two weeks into the job and transformers are blown and everything's gone. He's going, I've never seen anything like this. This was supposed to be an afternoon's work. I stopped making money the first day. I, I, this is costing me an arm and a leg. And we're like, sorry, uh, would you like some free coffee? Would you like some, uh, <laughs> I mean, we can... To pray with you, um, you know, but, but why was there so much opposition? It's like, because we're lighting the lights for something that will bring in 500 youth to hear the gospel, and it's going to hurt. It's just going to hurt. It's a mega door, and don't be surprised if there's mega door slams around it, too. And, I, you know, I, I've, I've seen it so much that I, I just don't even get surprised by it anymore. In fact, rather than discourage me, it actually has a reverse effect on me. It actually encourages me. I go, I don't see how this is important, but apparently it is. You know, apparently it is furthering a mission that matters. Um, and then you'll find out, you know, that something that you worked way too hard on somehow affected one kid. And they say, you know, at that play, that was the first time I ever really got it. And you're like, well, no wonder that play was so hard. It was just a little play. It was just nothing. But I guess it was something. And so I think about that. Remember the story I started with? Just like the film broke and the harsh reality come in, life comes in with incredible opposition. And I think if we forget this moment, if we think life all ends at 1 Corinthians 15, yay, it's so amazing, happy ever after, we go to be with God. He brings us back to earth and he says, it's going to be dusty. It's going to be rusty. It's going to be musty. <laughs> There's a lot of difficulty with this. And, you know, I think about that. That's why he said, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain because it will feel like labor and it will feel in vain. If, if it didn't feel that way, at times in the here and now, he wouldn't have to remind us of the there and then. So then the last P word that I want to share with you is people. People. Focusing on people. Because people are really the only eternal thing that there is. 
Everyone will live forever somewhere. And God gives us opportunities in the here and now to affect the there and then. And that's why Paul was such a people person. And even though he said earlier in his life, he wasn't. He self-described himself as an insolent man. What that means is I, I'm just an angry, angry, bitter, nasty guy. I mean, he's like, I don't like people. Don't, they don't like me. And I don't care because I got positions. I got power. I got everything I need. I don't need any of y'all. And so this was Paul saying that's what he was. And he became, because of the gospel, a people person, passionate about people. He directed his time and his talents toward those things. And you know what? Naturally, I am not a people person. And I've shared that with people. And, and the longer they get to know me, they go, you're right. I didn't believe you at first, but you're not. Um, but I'm not. But I am. Um, I, by God's grace, supernaturally, my adult life has been about this, about deprioritizing possessions and even my own plans and redirecting them toward people. And when I think about this, this is what Paul says, verse 10, now if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear. For he does the work of the Lord as I do also. Let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me for I'm waiting for him with the brethren. What's he saying? He's saying, treat Timothy well. Timothy was prone to being afraid, timid, right? Uh, but he was a guy that Paul says, you know what? Treat him nice. Uh, treat, don't despise him. Send him in peace. You know, take care of him. Don't make it hard and difficult on Timothy. Sometimes people who aren't people, people think life should be as hard on everyone as it ever was on them, right? Well, I had to have it hard in my life, so my, I will make it sure everyone has to make it just as painful. I had a terrible boss, so I'll be a terrible boss because I learned so much from my terrible boss. I'm like, no. If I learned something from my terrible boss, it's to never be a terrible boss. If I grew up in a, in a thankless, heartless home, well, then let me have a thankful, heart-filled home. You know, this is basically what he's saying. You know, Paul had written a tough letter, and he didn't want them to take their frustration out on Timothy. It's kind of like, look, Timothy didn't write any of these things. So if you got a beef, you got it with me, not with him. Just be nice to him. Uh, we can't wait for him to get back here. And, and look at this. This is amazing. This is, if you get nothing out of today, I hope you'll at least get this. Verse 12, he says, nothing con Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when it's a convenient time. You know what this tells me? <laughs> we need to know how to say no in the here and now because we prioritize eternity. Apollos is a guy who said no. He told Paul the apostle, no, I'm not going to do that. Paul strongly urged him. And he said, nah, I'm not going to do it. And I love that because Paul doesn't even say that carnal, terrible guy. What he did is he said, you know, I exhorted him. I gave him reasons why I thought it might be a great idea. I was really, and he said, you know what? He, he, he's not going to do it. But he will come when it's convenient for him, when it works for him. And I love this because <laughs> I work for God. You don't work for me, I don't work for you. Um, I work for God, so I will do with my life what works for God. Remember in chapter 1, the Corinthian church was so divided. They were like, I'm Apollos, I'm a Paul, I am of Jesus, I am of, you know, this. And they were all divided on this. And Paul didn't treat Apollos as a threat but he also didn't treat him as a child. He respected his plan and his way and his relationship with God enough to say that, well, I wish you'd tell me yes, but I understand that you can tell me no and still be good with God. And the relationship between Paul and Apollos shows the difference for me between being a people person and a people pleaser. Because you can't meet the expectation of every person. You won't please every person. Not in the here and now. There's just too much clock ticking and in chapter 15 Paul spoke about the glorified body we'll have one day and I don't know about you but I don't have one yet and what that means is things I used to be able to say yes to I got to say no to I can't burn the candle out all on both ends and up the middle uh, like I used to I just can't do it so someone might have a plan for my life <laughs> you know God has a plan for my life but so does everyone else 
hey, I have a plan for your life. I need you here Wednesday. I need you here Thursday. I need you this Wednesday while you're at this at, on the other thing. And I'm like, no. And I've had to learn to say no in Jesus' name to all kinds of things because in eternity, I will be at every party. In eternity, I will be at every birthday party, every event, everything anyone wants to be. Why? Because I got no limitations. I don't have to sleep. I don't have to rest. I don't have to recoup. And yet, this is what you see. He says, watch steadfast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. And he says, I urge you, brethren, verse 15, you know the household of Stephanus. That's the first fruits of Achaia and that they've devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I, I want you, verse 16, to submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I'm glad, verse 17 and 18, I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus for what was lacking in your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. See, when I think about what he's saying here, he's saying, man, serve the servants. Don't serve people who, who demand from you. He says, serve people who serve people. If you're going to figure out which yes and which no, look around and ask yourself, what is that person doing for others? And what are others doing for that person? Because again, sometimes the people who demand the most from themselves will do the least for others. Again, just patterns I see. In verse 19, you see the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that's in their house. All the brethren greet, greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. And Paul says, the salutation with my own hand, it's Paul. If anyone doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, well, let him be accursed. Oh, Lord, come. And then he says this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, when you think about what he's saying there, he, he has some strong words. Accursed. He says, let them be anathema. Let, let them be, let, them, let their choice be respected. You don't want to be around God now in the here and now? God's not going to force you to be with him with the there and then. And Paul is basically saying, I would prefer to be around people here and now who remind me of the there and then, who are interested in the things of heaven, who are focused in the things of heaven. And he says, people like Aquila and Priscilla, low maintenance, high output. And these people, he says, he, I don't have to constantly uh, you know, look after them because they're looking after the things of the Lord. And he says, Jesus is coming for all of us soon enough. Can't be soon enough in my book. Film will be over before you know it. <laughs> and you'll be on to the things of 1 Corinthians 15 again and so when i think about that again there's a direct connection between the here and now and the there and then and i hope if you if you think of this chapter as a as an unhappy ending to a cha to a book i hope you'll rethink it because it, to me the, the idea that we would not be possessed by our possessions that we would have plans that we know why we do what we do for how long in what place we do it and we'd be flexible enough to put as the lord permits across all of it but that's no excuse for not having a direction with my life and having things that i know why i say yes to them and i know why i say no to them uh, people i'm about people but i try 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 not to be a people pleaser because a people pleaser won't please God and won't please people because you'll say yes to everybody and in the end you'll say no to the things that matter most. So when I think about that, there it is. It's, it's possessions, it's, it's plans, it's people, but it's connecting the here and now to the there and then and living in light of eternity. So God, um, I pray that as we bring this time to a close, we would think uh, of each second, minute, hour, day, month, year, decade, of our lives uh, in light of the fact that they'll be over very soon. If we're suffering, it'll be over before we know it. If we're serving, it'll be over before we know it. And uh, we should be uh, mindful of those things and steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that it's not in vain if it's done in love. We pray it in Jesus' name.